Hello, hello, and welcome to everybody to the audience here at Web Day in Tamale, but also, of course, to our audience abroad, um, wherever you are um, in different climate zones. Um, we are here today for the second panel of the day. Um, in the afternoon, we're going to hear Thorsten Weber and um, Klaus, uh, sorry, Thorsten Wiese and Klaus Weber. Um, both historians um, with whom we have been working uh, over the last year as advisors, um, also with their texts that have been informing a lot of research we've been doing. Um, so here, uh, the space where we're sitting for the audience brought, so what you can see behind us is this particular space called Parliament of Ghosts um, that Ibrahim Mahama uh, created as one of the um, many uh, multi-purpose spaces that are, are located here in, in Tamale. Um, the Parliament of Ghosts, uh, you might see in the background, uh, in, uh, I don't know if you can see it through the camera, but uh, we have all these bales of Deep sets and um, cement bags, like let's say past containers and possible future containers of trading goods. So I think we are in a, here located in a perfect um, space for the purpose of our today's conversations. Um, we're going to start with Klaus Weber who's joining us from U the European University in Frankfurt, Frankfurt Oder. The title of his presentation is African and American Dimensions of German Photo Industries from the 17th to the 19th century. The examples of Australia and Silesia. Um, I would just briefly introduce, um, so, Professor Klaus Weber is a historian and professor of European and Social History at the Europa Universität Berlina. In 2001, he submitted a PhD thesis at the University of Hamburg on German merchants in the 18th century Atlantic trade. With his research interests also explore labor and welfare regimes in modern Europe and the Atlantic world and the global connections of Central Europe's early modern culture industries. His texts, Linen, Silver, Slaves and Coffee, a spa spatial approach to Central Europe's entanglements with the Atlantic economy from 2015 is one of the main reference texts of this paper. So I will give the word to Klaus now. Um, after this lecture, we're going to Continue immediately with questions and then have some space for QA after the two sessions. Okay. Yeah, um, many thanks for the invitation um, to contribute to your event with this talk. I will try to offer a kind of straightforward uh, nuts and bolts story, which is very empirical. And um, I want to emphasize that much of the contents I am owing to the research of Tobias Kovronek, who is not an historian, but a geochemist and geophysicist and an archaeologist. So he carries out a very interdisciplinary uh, research and he has made himself an excellent um, an expert in um, the copper and brass trade between German lands and Africa from the medieval period to the 19th century. And I'm owing a lot also to Anka Steffen, who defended her PhD thesis only last year here at um, the Adlina University. She investigated the Silesian linen trade in particular. So this is the structure of my talk. Um, we the historians are so much obsessed with the past that I go beyond the time frame I gave you in the title and want to begin in the medieval period. Um, in 1962, the French zoologist Theodore Monod carried out a research expedition in the Western Sahara. And by coincidence, 
he found the remains of a caravan that had perished there at some time in the early 11th century, a thousand years ago. You see the red dot on the map, uh, that's where uh, the find is situated. Actually, uh, by the way, he never retrieved it. Yeah, That was before um, the mobile phone that gave you the geodata. <clears throat> But um, he could uh, take with him some of the trading items which had been preserved in big quantities. And that was thousands of cowrie shells wrapped in bags and approximately 2,000 brass rods wrapped in bundles. 200, uh, sorry, 700 years after this caravan disaster occurred, a Dutch ship sunk off the easternmost tip of the island of Terschelling, about 100 kilometers north of Amsterdam. Um, and the shipwreck was only rediscovered in 2012 when a storm washed remains of the ship's structure and cargo ashore. Among the cargo were glass beads, clay tobacco pipes, and again brass rods wrapped in bundles. The rods were of almost exactly the same dimensions as those found in the desert. And we know very well for which purpose the 18th century rods um, were made. They um, were among the prevalent barter commodities shipped by Europeans to West Africa for purchasing slaves, which is why they were commonly known as Guinea rods, Guinea rods. We know exactly where the 18th century Guinea rods were produced it was in the brass manufacturing region of Stuhlberg on the outskirts of Aachen, or Aix-la-Chapelle, close to Germany's border with Belgium. But where did the medieval brass rods originate? <clears throat> Tobias, this geophysicist working at the mining museum in Bochum, he carried out an isotope analysis of the rods from the North Sea and those from the Sahara. And he firmly established that the zinc <clears throat> contained both in both rods came from the same mine, the legendary mine of Vieille Montagne or Altenberg near Stolberg in this German Belgian border region. It is the biggest zinc yield in Europe and the one offering the best quality. It had been exploited already in the Roman period and has been um, uh, exploited uninterrupted from the Middle Ages until today. The rods in the Sahara have been found alongside with these cowrie shells. These shells occur in the shallow waters of the Maledivian islands only in the Indian Ocean, and they were also used to buy West African slaves. The rods on the North Sea beach have been found alongside with glass beads and clay pipes, two more articles readily selling in the slave trade. There is no direct proof to it, but I make the claim that as early as in the 11th century, cowrie shells from the Indian Ocean <clears throat> and German made, made rods formed an assortment deliberately assembled in order to purchase gold and uh, enslaved Africans in sub-Sahara regions. This trans-Sahara trade brought millions of enslaved people to North Africa and to places as far as Egypt and Persia. We now jump from the early medieval to the early modern period and to Augsburg, a city in the south of Germany. Jakob Fugger, some of you may have heard this name, was one of the most wealthy and powerful merchant bankers of his time. His family came from rather modest uh, linen weaving in a village near Augsburg, but then this family climbed the social ladder when they moved into town. They became textile merchants, financiers and investors in Central European copper mining. In the mid-16th century, under the Portuguese flag, they sent their own brass and copper as far as India and more importantly to West Africa, where the Portuguese slave trade caused the expansion of markets for European commodities. A Portuguese ship which failed in 1532 on what is today the coast of Namibia was discovered in 2008. It was one of the seven, of the seven ship of the 45th fleet Portugal sent to India. 
<laughs> and we see a depiction here from that time. It was actually made for the maritime insurance. Yeah. Nowadays, you take photos, but the insurance company wanted exactly know which were the circumstances of the um, <clears throat> of the failure of the ship. Now, among the cargo, there were more than uh, 1,800 pieces of copper, totaling 17 tons, and all marked with the trademark of the Fuga, the Trident. This cargo <clears throat> was meant for India, but the Fuga and Welser also provided Portugal with huge volumes of copper and brassware for the slave trade. Much of it was produced in Nuremberg, one of the major German places for copper processing, and much of it still in the Aachen-Stuhlberg region, where the medieval rods originated. <clears throat> ordering, there were orderings of uh, barber bowls, saucepans, and manilas made by the Portuguese crown, and those orderings were in the range of ten thousands of items and by thousands of hundredweights, all explicitly meant for the African market. Between 1495 and 98, the Port Portuguese agent Manuel Fernandes alone purchased more than half a million Manilas via Antwerp. Manilas are these horseshoe-shaped brass objects which were uh, used as a currency in West Africa. Most of this was bartered for slaves, as I said, and much of the items, much of the metal was also used by African artisans to produce mundane and sacred objects. We see here depictions or photos of these famous um, Benin bronzes and here a crucifix made by uh, artisans in the Congo region in the late 6th or early 17th century. And the raw material, or at least much of it, came from these German lands. The rise of and the activities of the Fugger family nicely illustrates how German entrepreneurs and economies of the German territories as a whole adapted to the European maritime colonial expansion. Entrepreneurs like the Fugger and the Welser, that's another Augsburg dynasty, were in fact protagonists of this expansion. They were involved with the transformation of the Canary Islands, of Hispaniola, what is Haiti now, and of Brazil into plantation regions. <clears throat> Here we see export regions where linen is produced in Germany. I now try to summarize the most essential changes occurring in the course of the 17th century. We are now leaving the 16th when the Fuga were so important <clears throat> and entering this century of crisis where the 30 years wars um, was the cause for many changes. Until the Thirty Years' Wars, it was the imperial cities in southern Germany, like Augsburg and Nuremberg, um, which were the hothouse of economic development in the Holy Roman Empire, in the German lands of that time. And this changed when the Dutch Republic and England seriously challenged the Iberian monopoly in the Atlantic world. You know that Spain and Brazil, or Portugal rather, they claimed all of the Americas for themselves and um, other Western <laughs> European nations didn't accept that. In the 17th century, the large joint stock companies like the Dutch West India Company created in 1621 and the uh, British Royal African Company uh, from 1671, they started themselves to run plantations in the Americas and they became important players in the transatlantic slave trade. And these uh, two sectors, the slave trade and the plantation regions, they created new markets for German-made commodities, most prominently linen textiles and metalware. With the rise of the Dutch and the British colonial and commercial empires, more and more German-made goods were also shipped through the ports of Amsterdam and Hamburg on the North Sea coast. Previously, it was rather sent across the Alps and then um, um, across the Mediterranean. <clears throat> and accordingly, rural linen production 
And the cities where merchants organized this production and the quality control, they also began to flourish in northern Germany at the cost of the south. British and Dutch colonial expansion were significant drivers of the transatlantic slave trade, um, and that is expanding to its 18th century levels only in the late 17th century. In places like Ulm, Augsburg or Nuremberg, these old centers, the population had shrunk during the war and recovered only 300 years later in the course of the 19th century, while Westphalian cities like Bielefeld and Osnabrück became important economic centers. Hamburg grew from 40,000 to, uh, to, to 75,000 inhabitants during the 17th center and um, similar um, developments we have in other cities in the north. Genoa, in contrast, probably the most important 16th century gateway of German linen shipped to the Spanish world. Um, in Genoa, the German merchant community shrunk to only a few members by um, 1700. And here on this um, slide, you see how the volume of the transatlantic slave, slave trade rises significantly only from the 1660s and 1680s. Now, this is the period we are talking about now. And we will look at these two particular regions, Westphalia and Silesia, that were the most important production areas for linen in the late 17th and through the 18th century. And we will focus two towns. This is where many of the dominating merchants were uh, settled who controlled the linen weaving and spinning on the countryside, who um, carried out the quality control in these towns and then uh, shipped it into the Atlantic world. Now, um, so we come to this section of the talk, which is focusing Westphalian linen and putting it simply, there were two Atlantic markets for German linen. One in West Africa, another one in the plantation colonies of the Americas. And the uses of the textiles in these two regions were very different. In the Americas, German-made linen was mostly used as robust workwear for the slaves. Linen fibers are four times more uh, sturdy than those of cotton fibers, and therefore cotton was not suitable for workwear. And work wear did not need to be fashionable. It was not a consumer good. It was the plantation owners, thus the owners of the slaves, that bought the linen and gave it to their workers. For example, the uh, colonial law for the French colonies, the Côte Noir, it was decreed by the King Louis XIV in 1685. It obliged plantation owners to provide their slaves with a shelter, with specified quantities of food and of clothing. There was one article in this code, each year the master will have to furnish each of their slaves with two outfits of linen of four L's or um, uh, four L's of linen at the master's discretion. And um, <clears throat> on the West African coast, in contrast, things were different. <clears throat> the European buyers of slaves used linen and other textiles in the barter trade for slaves. The African sellers of slaves, many of whom were local or regional power holders, wanted high quality goods to be resold on the African markets or to be given as gifts to their retainers, soldiers, peasants, servants, etc. I mentioned already the copper and brassware, the linen for the enslaved was coarse, unbleached and scratchy. The linen for the African market had to be bleached as wide as it could possibly be. And it had to be soft, it had to be with an attractive weaving pattern and texture. It is obvious that this high quality linen required much more labor input than the coarse linen that was sent to the Americas. Oh, I'm afraid I 
didn't pick the um, latest version of my uh, slides. Okay. Um, in 1734, a wanted poster was issued in the British colony of Maryland, describing seven indentured servants who had run away from the plantations and other workplaces where they toiled. It was not only um, African-American slaves, there were also um, white um, um, convicted persons who had to serve their time there or um, free white, poor white people who had signed uh, labor contracts to serve on plantations for four or five years. And here we have um, the wanted posters for seven of them who made an escape. And um, not only Thomas Pierce, the short, brisk fellow mentioned, or James Oakland, a fat young man, about 30 to 25 years old, I quote from the wanted poster, were wearing Ozenbrick shirts and frocks and trousers, all the seven did. Ozenbrick, Osnaburg, Osnabrück, in fact, had become the generic term for work wear in the Caribbean and in British America, in use in the United States and uh, even into the, uh, the 20th century when they were made of cotton. Sorry, I have to jump back and forth. And um, by the 1730s, the linen region allowed Osnabrück had become the major provider of such linen. Linen regions in southern uh, Germany Dr. continued. Dr. Sorry? Uh, please give us uh, one minute. We're yeah? we lost the loud speaker. So we're just trying to figure it out now. Please give us a short time. Let me check if that one is on, the blue lights at the front. If not, okay. Yeah, uh, Klaus, there's a slight problem we're having with our sound. So maybe yeah. five minutes more. And... No, no problem. I'm, right. um, and um, it's not, the problem is not on my side with my micro or. No. Uh, no yeah, okay, it's thanks. It's not on your side. Yeah. So we're just trying okay. to resolve it here. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks.
Hi, Klaus. Can you hear us? I hear you. Okay, good. So let me just make this connection. The only button for you. Ich höre dich weiterhin. Gut, übrigens. Ja, ich höre dich auch. Ja. Okay. Zumindest da gibt es kein Problem. Mhm. Ja. Hi, uh, Klaus, can you hear us? Yes, I can yes, hear can you. you. Very good. So we can continue. Sorry yeah. for the Don't worry. Okay, so um, let's go on. Um, we were interrupted when I was talking about these uh, escapees, and each and Every one of them was wearing one or two or even more pieces of clothing of Ozenbrick linen. Yeah? And um, there were more linen regions and all had themselves made their name, but the dominant was Osnabrück. Yeah? And we see that there were more um, varieties and qualities of linen produced in the same region. They were called Stout Weser Flaxen or Truborn Tecklenburgs. That's another province in that region. Or Rosas de Westfalia. These certainly were of a far better quality than uh, the ones used as workwear. And in Silesia, um, linen uh, from there was known as sletias. Wherever you see this in the sources, um, it's actually Silesian linen. And all of these linens from rather northern regions in Germany, where they were shipped through Hamburg, Bremen, and Dutch ports. Um, and here, from the uh, textile museum in Bramsch near Osnabrück, you see what remains of a loom, of a hand loom on these. Um, it, it looks very simple, but still it's a sophisticated machine. And here you see a linen weaver in Latvia today. Uh, this lady is probably producing for a very small market, uh, probably uh, souvenirs for tourists. Yeah? But linen was also linen production very widespread in the whole Baltic region. And this is what the Osnabrück linen must have looked like. This is from a 19th century pattern book, so a more recent period. And this is an even more sturdy fabric. It was used as packaging material, but you can have an idea of the texture. Yeah? Now, um, I had mentioned the Fugger and Welser families from Augsburg. They had business partners and employees who organized their far-flung networks, which stretched even to Brazil or to the uh, Canary Islands or Madeira. And um, in the late 17th century, the uh, textile merchants in Westphalian cities were making their way to the economic elite. And they established family networks which were run by members of the same family, brothers, sons, 
and nephews or sons-in-law of the head of the firms would open branches in London, Amsterdam, Nantes, or Bordeaux, in Lisbon, or Cadiz, in all these important Atlantic seaports in Western Europe. And there they would introduce the products that came from their regions of origin, not only from Osnabrück. The German traders would move along the commodity chain as close to the markets as they this was the there the most successful among them would form matrimonial alliances with merchant families of their respective host cities and i want to offer one example the Ellermann family they came from a small village outside Osnabrück, just 10 or 15 kilometers outside the town. And Johann Arnold Ellermann moved to Cadiz, the most important uh, uh, Spanish port city for Atlantic trade. He moved to Cadiz in the early 1920s and ran a company there with his brother, um, Hermann Ellermann. And Hermann even traveled to uh, Spanish America, and he could do this only illegally because he was not Spanish and he was not Catholic. These people were actually barred from these regions. Another brother, Justus, he moved to Amsterdam, another strategically important place of trade. Johann Arnold Ellermann went back to Germany in the 1730s, but not to his home village or home region, but to Hamburg. And there he soon became the chairman of the Commerce Deputation. That's the Chamber of Commerce in Hamburg. So he came from a village, moved to Spain, and came back and made it immediately into the very elite of the biggest German port city. From the 1760s, his son Johann Heinrich ran the trading house in Cadiz, which had become one of the most successful German firms in the Spanish port. He also ran salt works and had acquired real estate in this very expensive town, and he held shares in Hanseatic ships, so he had become a ship owner. One of his shareholding partners was Johann Jakob Schlieper, whose daughter in turn was married to Prudencio de la Ville, a slave trader from Nantes who had moved to Cadiz. In Cadiz, de la Ville created the Compañía Gaditana de Negros, at that time the biggest Spanish slave trading company. It was meant to increase the uh, Spanish portion in this sector, which was minimum before the 17th century. Around 1800, de la Ville was deemed the richest man in Cadiz. <clears throat> the elements remained in Cadiz at least until 30 more commercial how commercial networks were Creek world. Um, Bremen and who settled in um, London in the 1720s. They soon became members and even uh, directors of the Royal African or of the um, um, English Company of Merching, Merchants Trading with Africa. That was the name of this um, slave trading company. They became very much involved in the sugar trade. And more importantly, they became one of the three or four most important merchant banks in the city of London. And they were among the leading banks even in the late 20th century. The third example would be the Schröder family. The Schröders were originating from Quakenbrück, a small town in the bishopric of Osnabrück, and they had arrived in London well before 1800. They were also present in Bremen and Hamburg. In Hamburg and in St. Petersburg, family members ran sugar refineries. And um, 
Um, it is not surprising that both the Barings and the Schröders were anti-abolitionists. Yeah? So they were against the abolition of the slave trade and they were against um, the abolition of slavery in the colonies, even though the Barings, they changed their attitude in the late 18th century. These links between rural linen regions, banking and the capital intensive slave trade reminds us of the Welser and Fugger, these financiers in um, Augsburg 200 years earlier. And they also remind us of 18th century banking houses in Frankfurt on the River Main, today's financial center in Germany, because there too there were banks that were involved in this sector, in the textile industries or rather protest industries, in copper mining, in banking and with strong ties to Atlantic plantation economies. In Frankfurt, this applies in particular to the Bethmann and the Metzler family. They ran the biggest banks in Frankfurt in the 18th and early 19th centuries. So that much uh, for the case of Westphalia. We will now move to Silesia, where, as I highlighted before, a completely different quality of linen was produced. I um, quote from a letter that Arthur Wendover, agent of the Royal African Company in James Four near Accra, wrote in 1745. In this letter to London, he complained that all vendable goods are gone as sletias and other cloths. And if there be any goods that can be spared, for God's sake, let us have them. Sletias, of course, or fine sheets or any sorts of linen. Yeah? He was desperately demanding for more merchandise because all the time he could sell it at a good profit. He just didn't have it in stock. This implies that the fabric was really popular <laughs> among the clients and merchants of the African merchants in this region. Now, in the case of Silesia too, it had been the 30 years war that had contributed to the rise of linen production. During the war, the province had suffered a lot and the surviving population had fled to the village, from the villages in the fertile lowlands to the mountain regions where they found refuge. And it was in these mountain regions where you couldn't grow grain or other um, uh, staple food that you could grow flax, the raw material for linen. And the local nobility welcomed these um, uh, refugees and offered them um, to settle in their villages because at that time serfdom was still in place and all the villagers were um, obliged to um, serve a certain amount of days for their noble landlords. And in that case, they not only worked on the fields uh, of the um, nobility, but they also produced yarn and linen, which the um, uh, noble landowners then sold to the markets. So they benefited from this and um, each villager had to produce a certain amount of yarn or linen um, each year for their overlords. In parallel with the growth of the transatlantic slave trade, in uh, you he see here outside um, Hirschberg the linen that is spread out on the lawns uh, to be bleached in the sun. Yeah, it looks like uh, these uh, white stripes on the lawn outside town. Now, in the uh, decades after the uh, Thirty Years' War, there was a new class of economic actors emerging, merchants who settled in these towns and who uh, managed to buy the textiles directly from the uh, peasants or paid them extra money to produce, to produce for them outside the serfdom sector. And so these merchants managed to um, carve out their own place in the linen trade. And some of them became within only a few decades so wealthy that they could buy from the nobility their 
landed estates. And with the landed estates, they bought the villages. And with the villages, in a way, they bought the laborers there, who were then obliged to work for these merchants. And um, the new owners from this merchant class, they even squeezed, um, after they had squeezed out the uh, noble landowners from this sector, they squeezed um, um, out more work from their peasants. They established a labor regime that was more exploitative and more capitalist than the older, rather paternalist regime maintained by the nobility. Now, tens of thousands of served had to produce the textiles the merchants exported at very handsome profits, which these in turn invested into even more estates and in the workforce that came with it. In many respects, for example, regarding the input of nutritional calories, the living condition of these serfs were worse than that of for many slaves in the Americas. Like slaves, they had no pay except for the pieces of linen they produced in excess of the workload that was um, imposed on them um, with serfdom. And even that pay was extremely low. And these very low labor costs, they explain why the high quality linen was produced in Silesia and not in, in Westphalia. As I emphasized before, high quality linen um, demands much more labor input yeah, to obtain this quality. And in order to be and to remain competitive, the merchants needed to employ the cheapest workforce they could possibly find. And therefore, 17th century merchants went to Silesia, where the um, uh, labor cost was lower in general, and where on top of that serfdom was still existing. And ultimately, they succeeded in controlling not only the workforce, but also in um, um, being dominant in the trading networks that reached even distant markets. So in the course of the late 17th and um, 18th century in Hirschberg and other towny towns, which were also the residential places of this merchant elite like Landeshut or Greifenstein, um, the merchants had their urban residences, but um, they tried, and their counting houses, but they tried to spend most of their time on the estates. There they copied the lifestyle of the nobility they had squeezed out. The examples of Menzel and of Gottfried, two merchant families and their rural palaces, Lomnitz and Wernersdorf, shall that of Lorian Menzel in the early 18th century, and it was in hands of this family far into the 19th century. Here we see Wernersdorf, the estate of um, the Gottfried family, purchased by this merchant in 1725. And um, this was not only um, a rural palace, it was... Uh, Um, uh, the same time. And um, it offers us allegories of linen or depictions of linen production and allegories of maritime trade. Here we see a kind of Neptune figure who is carrying a ship. We see um, at the bottom, you see in circled in red, this figure with the Neptune and next to the this red circle, you see the anchor, yeah, which um, hope and of faith, but it is also a maritime symbol because the entire trade was um, ultimately a maritime trade, even if they lived in such a landlocked.
of this image. Um, two boys, white boys, who are cutting linen cloth. And <clears throat> here, um, one of these boys in the background, we see the very same estate. And again, you see the linen. Uh, spread out on the lawn to be bleached in the sun. Yeah, so this is a very nice example how in image and actually in the material building and its uses in the 18th century, the whole um, very um, global trade is represented. The linen trade was not only profitable for the merchants, but also for the state. During the decades here considered, Silesia had become the economically best developed province of the Habsburg Empire. And this is why the Prussian King Frederick II waged three wars, the Silesian Wars between 1740 and 63, in order to conquer this promise, province, and he succeeded. When it was, uh, it had become Prussian, the Prussian custom records, beginning with the annexation, demonstrate that 75% of all linen exports were destined for Western Europe, West Africa, and the Americas. Another 10% of Silesian linen export were destined for Western German regions, but I assume that these were only further processed there to add some more value to it and then also channeled into the Western Hemisphere. And these exports generated more than 10% of Prussian state revenue. On the two maps left, you see uh, the extension of the Prussian territory with the conquest of Silesia. Yeah, this um, uh, blue um, uh, colored territory, more or less in the center of the two uh, small maps of the lower map. <clears throat> the proportion of Silesian linen within the enormous commodity flows generated by the slave trade was also considerable. We see here just one example, the cargo of a British slave ship, the Mermaid, that purchased most of its cargo in Rotterdam, not in Britain. They often went to Rotterdam or in, to Hamburg, where they, they're closer to the linen producing regions and there they could buy it cheaper than in London. And we see that uh, 4,000 pieces of textiles on board these ships were sletias. Even more telling is an analysis of the textiles shipped not only by one vessel, but by the Royal African Company since the 1680s. Um, and since the 1680s, Silesian linen was outperforming even Indian cottons on West African markets. It's this yellow graph that depicts the portion of Sletyas on board Royal African Company ships. And we see how it goes up in the 1680s. And um, I cannot go into detail here. It also has to do with the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade um, as a whole. Now, as economic historians, we know little about the uses of Silesian linen in West Africa and why they were so much in demand. We assume that one reason that they were so much in demand was that they also served um, ritual purposes. White, not only in West Africa, is the color of purity, and there even more, it offered protection against dis disease and mishaps. It was appreciated by the deities. And therefore, among the merchants, there were also always small samples of textiles sent with their orders, insisting that the delivery, what they would receive, would exactly correspond with what um, they were sending here as a sample. Very nice, this uh, really white um, uh, linen sample from the correspondence of the Hirschberg merchant Johann Heinrich Martens. 
And I just want to contrast this again with the color of the unbleached Westphalian linen. Yeah, so you see um, the contrast. Now, a large number of copper and brassware has been preserved for research. This material doesn't rust and it doesn't rot, but textiles do. And therefore, we really depend on these small snippets to have an idea what exactly these uh, textiles looked like. Um, and this is a depiction of a place where trade is going on at the very center of it. I'm expanding this a little bit. We see a merchant who is spreading out this bale of textiles, maybe Silesian linens, to show the buyers what good quality he is offering. And um, when we look at uh, late 18th or early 19th century illustrations of everyday life in the plantations in, we, in the Americas, we really see that outside their labor days, even the slaves had the means to buy more attractive textiles and that white was something that was very prominent among them. So we assume that this aspect of African culture, of African material culture, the slaves or the enslaved people brought with them into uh, the uh, plantation regions where they were um, deported. This is um, also a late 18th century illustration from a travel account of a German scholar. And here he shows uh, African women. Um, it says, Akraische Frauenzimmer, women from Accra. They are uh, most certainly wearing Indian cottons because we see floral ornaments on it. And that was not uh, nothing that was applied in uh, German linens. Yeah, they had uh, weaving patterns, by, but they wouldn't have colorful ornaments on it. Here you see probably a little bit better the ornament. And here we see um, photos from Nigeria, from a religious ritual for the Orisha deities and here for the most important Orisha La. And in all these rituals, white is very important. The uh, rooms for carrying out in these rituals, they are also, um, uh, all the walls are painted in white, etc. And you see that even the co colors are painted. So we are speculating that this um, uh, cultural religious background was one important factor. <clears throat> now I'm coming to the conclusion. Um, we all know that the plantation economy did thrive because in Europe, more and more people wanted these previously exotic and very uh, expensive goods. And with the expansion of um, the plantation economy, more and more goods became accessible to Europeans. And in particular in the Netherlands and in Britain, um, consumption expanded. <clears throat> and this is why uh, economic historians are talking about a consumer, about an 18th century consumer revolution. You can also see that in Germany, but they're at a far slower pace. And it was driven by the accessibility of these previously very expensive plantation products. The contemporaries were very much aware of it. They were lamenting, for example, in the calico craze in Europe, the craze for Indian cotton textiles or European-made cottons which copied the Indian patterns. And um, they were complaining about this not so much because of the slave labor used in its production, but because they uh, deemed conspicuous consumption uh, questionable, both in moral and economic terms. Only from the mid 18th century did um, abolitionist discourse also play into it. Um, 
And um, I'm mentioning this to highlight that contemporaries were very aware of this diffusion of uh, colonial goods and um, that it was ever more and ever easier accessible to larger segments of society. But I dare to say that such a consumer revolution did not happen in Europe only. There was probably not, a, well, there was a calico craze in Africa, but there was also a linen craze. It was not only the craving for Europe of Europeans for sugar, coffee and tobacco and their predilection for cotton clothing that drove the enslavement of Africans, but also the African predilection for European and Indian textiles for American tobacco, and the glassware from Bohemia, to name just a few examples. I do not at all want to downplay the responsibility of Europeans, but Africans too were not victims only. There were actors, African actors in the struggle and fights against enslavement and slavery, but there were also many individuals who were benefiting from the accessibility of previously inaccessible or even unknown goods. And like millions of Europeans, they were not directly involved, but indirectly as consumers, often ignorant of the close economic connections with the slave trade. And here I want to quote uh, Nula Zahedi, um, an Irish um, uh, colleague, also an economic historian, and she wrote, referring to this copper trade, few consumers fully understood that their own direct involvement in the American marketplace and the production of imported luxuries, or recognized their own links to enslaved workers in the Caribbean. But in fact, both uh, workers on both sides of the Atlantic were inextricably chained together in a complex process of economic and social change. And this also included Africa. And Nula Sahedi's sentences probably also reminds us of individual responsibilities today in our own patterns of consumption. And with this, I come to an end. Many thanks for attending. for this presentation. Um, it is a lot of material here. Most of us are not historians. Um, so, this is a future. Because we lost some time earlier to the technical problems. Be Bettina, ex excuse me. It's very, I can hardly understand the word. The quality was much better before. Okay, we're working on it. Yeah, maybe if you have the microphone closer. Uh, I think that's not the problem. I have it. Uh, no, it doesn't help. Can you hear me better now? I think it's somewhat better, yeah? Mm -hmm. better. Okay. Um, I, I'll be out of the picture, but hopefully that will come soon. Um, yeah, I was just saying, um, as we already lost some time with the technical problems, I suggest that we immediately move now to Dr. Jesus' presentation. And um, if you would like, if you would be able to stay with us uh, for the Q&A, uh, which will then be in about 14 minutes. But you know, now I can hear you. If you stay where you are. <laughs> if now, I stay there, no, I have a feedback, sorry. Yeah, now it's much better. Sorry for interrupting all the time. Yeah, it looks better now. Huh? Yeah, I think it's better. <laughs> okay. We're trying. Yeah. Okay, now, now I think this is better. The hall is gone also. Okay. Um, yeah, Thorsten um, Wiesel uh, was someone who, like, 
Ibrahim Mahama, Crazy Renaye, and I uh, have been consulting a lot while being in Osnabrück. Somebody who also uh, did a lot of uh, guided tours in the city. Um, this, um, this tour, that like a decolonial tour in a way, uh, was informing a lot of, of our research. Um, and he was also one of the experts who was speaking, um, who was invited to, to speak to audiences in the public program around Iran's peace. Um, so just to briefly introduce him, uh, Thorsten Hese studied history, political science, and art history in Osnabrück and in Hull in the UK. In 2002, he obtained his PhD at the Martin Luther University of Halle in Wittenberg. He's a co-director and curator for local and cultural history at the Museums Quartier of Osnabrück. He also is temporary lecturer for museological didactics and museum education at the University of Osnabrück. His scientific publications and editions deal with museology, history didactics, as well as the history of colonialism, migration, and national socialism. His last publication offers global history as an exhibition concept and perspective to decolonize historical museums and exhibitions. So the lecture he's giving today is titled, Let's Talk About Osnabrück, um, Decolonizing European Master Narratives for Teaching Local History. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> I hope that you can hear me clearly. Sorry, uh, Klaus, could you please ex exit your presentation? The, the screen sharing? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. So my, my presentation is visible now. Yes. Right, Bettina? Yeah, everything fine, is fine. Thank you very much. So after Klaus, who had gave us a lot of interesting details about the, the linen the trade and the importance of linen, I want to um, focus on another aspect. I want to talk about how we talk about history. I want to talk about storytelling and narrations. And uh, of course, I want to talk about maths and narratives too. At the beginning, um, I am... You don't know me up to now. I am. I want to ask um, the question: Who are we? Who am I? Even if you don't, if I don't wear a hat, I am a European. This is what connects me with those four men with hats who an indigenous sailor from the Tonga Islands saw about 1886 and drew them on this headrest. Dressed men with heads, those guys are strangers from Europe. Even for you, my audience, I must be a stranger. Therefore, it would be a great honor to me if you listen to me for a while. Thank you very much in advance. Just to present me, I am a German historian who works in a museum in Osnabrück, dealing with a local and regional history. From this museum also derives the mentioned headrest. It was brought to Osnabrück by a sailor from a journey to the Pacific area and offered to the museum as a present. When I tell stories about history in a German town like Osnabrück, I, as a town historian, normally would tell something about this place, Osnabrück. This local narrative takes place thousands of kilometers away from places in Africa, Asia, or the Pacific region, once being colonized by Germans. What does this have to do with decolonization? I would say quite a lot, because it is an important question in which way I talk about history, what kind of narrative I choose. We either may tell local history in a very unsensitive way, having more or less our blinkers attitude without reflecting more far-reaching relations. 
Thus, like you see it in the town museum of Saalfeld, this beehive from about 1800, with its obvious colonial context, is put quite thoughtlessly near an elevator that is reserved for the staff only. You can see this little sign, no für personal. So staff, service to serve, slaves, slavery. Or we change our perspective and tell local history taking global relations into consideration and therefore connecting different narrations. This is what I call telling global history or global histories. So the combination of um, local and global. To think local history in a global dimension means to create a consciousness that the reality of difference and the aim to form a joint conditio humana may not contradict but interact. This needs, of course, a paradigm shift that at the same time works like a sort of reparation for the historical injustice caused by colonialism and having been denied for a long time. We recognize a long one-sided view from Europe on the world, from towns like Osnabrück, looking just not further than to the town wall. This angle of vision blocked to perceive the person opposite that had already been inside, that existed, and that was influenced directly by the own activities, but that was not so much looked at. Just to say it with Achil Mbembe, an African voice, he says, getting used to the death of the other with whom you think you haven't anything in common. These different forms of letting living springs of life get dry in the name of race and difference. All this has left a deep impact on thoughts and ideas in culture as well as in social and economic relations. The wounds and injuries prevent the production of community. In fact, the construction of the common is inseparably bound to the repeated invention of community. After centuries of wounds hit by the history of colonialism, both sides should be connected in pain. We need reconcilement by, as Bamba describes it, a repeated invention of community. One possibility could be a narrative of history that does not leave parts of history apart. A narrative that shows that the one listens to the other and tries to understand him or her. As a basement of such a telling, this initially needs a joint knowledge from each other and for each other. To develop this knowledge in an appropriate way, we should find a narration that links, that links local people with global events. This is what is meant by telling global history. Only by combining several perspectives, the historical consideration can take a positive turn, namely by interpreting and understanding world history as a joint growth of humanity. World history belongs to all of us. We learn about it in our local shaping. A, gro a global transnational historical consciousness that takes multiple perspectives into account and combines micro and macro historical shifts, widens our views. That means it opens up our minds. On the one hand, the duplication of perspectives is an important counter strategy to overcome the dominance of traditional Eurocentric points of view by including other angles of vision. On the one hand, allowing multiple perspectives also helps to overcome unilateral, national, regional, or locally centered views of history. Those one-sided historic narrations entice to construct closely shaped identities, comparable to the post-colonial description of Europe as a province by Dipesh Chakrabatris. Global history as a paradigm shift reveals the ongoing impact of colonialism until today by its local effects. Unmasking historic narratives visualizes in how far this historic socialization has left its mark, its mark on our consciousness until today. In order to be able to react on this printing of our minds in a good way, it's important to understand that these prints 
are so powerful because they work by power of use in a sense of wielding authority over someone on the one hand and feeling the full force on the other. This shift of perspective then enables to honor the damaged, harassed lives of the others by making these lives visible. Paying attention in this way can be understood as a retrospective form of grieving too. Telling local histories enables to reflect simultaneously on yourself, on the stranger or the other. Global history offers new possibilities to analyze in a critical way historic phenomena and their modes of action on all levels, from local over national up to European and global history. This reflection contributes in creating the consciousness that citizens of a town are always part of a global interweaved history too, and therefore they are responsible to deal with this history. By discussing colonialism in a critical progressive way, we get the opportunity for real paradigm shift, a real sell out of colonialism. Considering a migration society like we have in Germany today, or all over the world even, that obviously will get even more diverse in future by globalization, where people always will live in local structures in those societies, a global historic consciousness offers a good frame to support the common process of developing society and its basements by looking back to the historic foundations and experiences. Under this condition, we do no longer talk about history as a basis of one uniform origin identity, but of a greater pool of various identities. This pool allows developing a broader historic consciousness as a basement of a diverse and pluralistic society. In the way this pool reflects historic processes and structures, balance of power and options of acting, rigid identities like the so primary culture can be exposed as being not historical. Instead of a singular identity, based on a fixed and narrow culture and in inevitably excluding the other, the pool gives room to more flexible fields of identities, which against or even because of their complexity show where we come from and what has influenced us. Depicting historical processes that means to make visible changeability as well as its reasons and predictions. It means that culture is not stable homogeneous and firmly established, but culture is characterized by openness, con contradictions, dispute, conflict, innovation and resistance. The human rights are the normative basis and intercultural mediation author mediating authorities of these discursive processes. Especially having this in mind and taking the actual social discussion into account, it makes again sense to tell town history as local history. It is a good way to overcome master narratives as exclusive dominant narrations, trying to narrow down historical perspectives to a certain level. Instead, local history opens a perspectivity at eye level with the other local histories related to it in any form. This is a question of trust, uh, transparency too. Therefore, Local history in a growing globalized world seems to essentially offer important as well as functional starting points to design a critical historic consciousness pointing into the future. Here the history of colonialism plays a crucial role. From the very beginning, colonialism as well as colonial imperialism were quite influential by their visual appearances three-dimensional manifestations in so-called cabinets of curiosities, where you could see the macrocosm and microcosms had a great impact. During the centuries of the colonial and imperial period, cultural and art treasures from abroad were collected for European art collections and museums. The objects represented strange and unknown worlds apart from satisfying the wish to get to know something about the other 
and the exotic, these collections serve to affirm the status quo of political power by visualizing the difference between Europe and the rest of the world, mother country and colony, civilization and nature, white and black. At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the ethnological exhibitions, or in German, Völkerschauen, as well as the big world and colonial exhibitions were the climax of a scenographical visualization of colonial imperialism. Ethnological museums uprising at the same time became the institutionalized part of these fairy-like events. Their collections formed the scientists' basis of their ethnological research on race theory, which led to a pseudo-legitimization for the colonial empires to occupy the whole world. There was only a small step left from their theories to the cruel racial ideology of national socialism, by the way. Exhibitions, as well as museums, visualized the hierarchy of colonialism, and this is important, without words, but therefore even stronger, because the pictures are talking much more. In order to finally overcome this imperialistic scenography of the imperial period, it needs a committed change of perspectives. We talk about overcoming in post-colonial days a visual illiteracy that has up to now hardly been recognized. It makes communication in our migration societies in the actual period of globalization quite difficult and imposes strong restrictions on joint social interaction. Global history is a helpful means to support this process of overcoming. The town, like a magnifier, mirrors the overall events in a local level and, in the same moment, we realize the mutual involvement between the local and the global sphere. We have to do with a microcosm of an empire that mirrors national structures of power in a smaller, better understandable scale. Furthermore, local history is a quarrel with the other by meeting yourself in confrontation. With a from a local point of view in the world, local history is a considered paradigm shift versus the direction it's a global. To come to Osnabrück, so just to prove what I want to say in this theory words, I want to talk, for example, about Osnabrück. The main aim of global history is to make this joint history experienceable as a reality of multiple perspectives, which helps to build up a future of solidarity. In the following chapter, I will try to explain this concept to given, by giving an example. It would like to talk about the linen trade of Josnabrück in the early modern times. This example is also a part of my post-colonial guides to us through Osnabrück, following the traces of colonialism. Bettina mentioned my, my tours I'm giving perhaps once a month. In the traditional narrative of Osnabrück's history, trading linen would play a central role. One could say uh, the item is Osnabrück was a successful trader's town in the Hanseatic League. The stamp of the Osnabrück Lager, the place where linen made of flax was proved, sealed and taxed, is a means to visualize the economic importance of the Osnabrück linen trade. Since the 14th century, linen fabric produced by the poorer farmers class in the Osnabrück region was one of the main trading articles of Osnabrück merchants, as Klaus had already pointed out. Linen even was the main economic factor in the region. It was the main tax income of the town, too. Up to the 19th century, the local lager was the biggest collecting point and exchange for linen in the northwest of former Germany. Every linen bale, having been produced in the region, had to be presented at the Osnabrück Lager in order to check its shape and quality. For this forced control, the town got a fee, the so-called Lager tax. The stamp printed on the linen after the review was a confirmation for every buyer that proved the high quality standards. The message of this traditional narration would be 
Osnabrück, as a part of the economically strong German Hanseatic League, got rich by trading with linen. So we are talking about economic success. A wonderful story, still very important in politics today. This narrative, though, with regard to a content beyond economic questions, does not really encourage thinking about more far-reaching connections. So, and from the legacy stamp, local objects like the Osnabrück, um, I'm not using um, words like, so I don't use the N-word, so it's um, the N Taufpredigt from May 1800, uh, 1661. Early modern print published by the FN angelic pastor and could instead reveal such a colonial link and therefore enforce a far-going increase of our historic consciousness. What is the background behind this sermon? In 1656, the, the Osnabrück mayor Gerhard Schäpela bought an 11-year-old enslaved African boy sold by the West Frisian merchant Samuel Schmidt in Hamburg. In 1661, this boy was baptized in Osnabrück. His new Christian name was Christian Gerhard Schäpeler. The boy was probably born in 1955 or 56 in Guinea. At the age of four, while playing on the beach, he was kidnapped by Dutch soldiers during their patrol on the coast. He was then sold to Schmidt and brought to the Netherlands. They served as a domestic for seven years before being sold to Schäpeler in Hamburg. This published sermon of 1661 is up to now the earliest proof of an African living in Osnabrück. The story of the young baptized African allows us to visualize the link between the local history of Osnabrück and global historical events and developments. In the context of economic history, we get aware that linen was not only one of the important trading goods, bringing prosperity to the Osnabrück region, Instead, Truborn Osnabrücks was the main trading article in overseas trade. In England and America, the Osnabrück legacy guaranteed highest quality. We know of British merchants regularly complaining about the concurrence with the, of the Westphalian linen trade in America. Names like Osnabrücks were valuable trademarks being copied by purpose by British merchants in order to stay compatible compatible versus the German linen. In the Americas, linen from Osnabrück was very much valued because of its survivability in the tropic zone. Moreover, it was quite cheap because of the poor conditions under which the linen was produced. Osnabrück's was sold and traded over Holland, England and Spain to the Americas as well as to the Caribbean islands like Santo Domingo, San Thomas and Havana. Hence, Osnabrück participated in the global system of the early capitalistic three-angle trade between Europe, Africa, and America, flourishing between the 16th and the 18th century. European goods went to Africa, enslaved Africans were transported to America and forced to work on the plantations. Finally, the products from the plantations were shipped back to Europe. On the Caribbean plantations, linen from Osnabrück was much in demand. It was used as a cheap and durable material to produce light clothes for the enslaved workers. About 1744, on Barbados only, 70,000 enslaved workers were clothing made of Osnabrück. And as Klaus has explained, there were just laws. So this explains, of course, why it was so broad, so much spread. The Osnabrück region profited directly from its effects on the trading and economic processes on markets being far away only in a geographic understanding. Furthermore, the prosperity affected different social groups on a different level, well understood. The main merchants and middlemen who organized the trade of Osnabrück linen, as well as the town that had the legatex as an important income. Even the rural families who grew, proce processed and sold flax, the weavers who produced the linen, as well as those who organized the fabrication in a proto-industrial way. They all earned by the fact that in the Caribbean, enslaved people were forced to work on plantations. Concerning Osnabrück, 
This means the slavery system increased the demand on Osnabrück's and therefore created work and jobs in the region. Over short and long, su such a stable fabrication created buying power in the broader classes to consume colonial goods. The narrow relation between the local Osnabrück area and the global economy has also been mentioned very well by looking at the linen merchants. I short this a bit because uh, Klaus has already explained how the relation was. So Osnabrück merchants going to to London to just profit uh, from the infrastructural and financial resources of the global trade there. Other important actors were the salesmen. They built an important profession that was elementary for the functioning of the overseas trade system. Sailors may be told the real mobile cosmopolitans at those days. Since the 17th century, about 300 or 350,000 seamen drove the slave ships crossing the Atlantic. Some of them came from Osnabrück too, serving as nautical as well as non-nautical workers. After the arrival in Africa, the ships had to be converted for the transport of a great number of enslaved people. This work was done, for example, by carpenters. During their stay in Africa and afterwards during the middle passage to America, the crews had to guard the human merchandise. They were allowed to use whips to discipline and punish the prisoners. The plantation complex, which is with its interaction between production and consummation, had a broad dynamics that mostly was not connected to the slavery because the broader global context has been denied. This makes clear, however, that at the latest local history in Germany as well as in Europe since the 18th century is always linked is linked history, a global and colonial history of slavery. This is how we come back to Christian Gerhard Schäpeler and the baptism of 1661 in Osnabrück. The Osnabrück linen trade with its genes of the early modern times, if you might tell these trousers, well known as Osnabrück trousers, is as well part of the colonial triangle trade as the young African on his way from West Africa to Osnabrück. His story is an example how the mechanisms of the early modern global structures of power and trade affected the local level. Those mechanism, mechanisms made it possible that human beings were enslaved and deported against their will. This is exactly what happened to Christian Gerhard Schäpeler from Africa. At the same time, we touch important refer references to the history of religion. The baptism from 1661 was orchestrated by purpose as a major event. It showed that the Protestant fraction in Osnabrück had recovered its self-confidence. During the Thirty Years' War, the two Catholic bishops, von Hohenzollern and of Wadenberg, had pushed back the Protestants in Osnabrück in a severe way. Pastors had been forced to leave the town. The elections of the Protestant town council had been manipulated and a Catholic university had been founded. Only with the occupation of the town by Swedish Protestant troops in 1633, this process has been stopped and cancelled. The baptism of May 18, 1661 was, in this context, an extraordinary celebration, as proves the list of guests, when in the morning at 7 a.m., a long procession walked through the town from the apartment of Schäpelers in the Große Straße on its way to the church St. Mary. As an observer, you became aware of a real Protestant who is who. At the head of the procession went this young African bareheaded. The godfathers and mothers proved the highly official character of this religious happening, as well as the pastor who led the service in St. Mary. Master Johannes Ludovici was not just a normal priest, but he was the superintendent in Osnabrück, which means he was the highest Protestant in town. In his populist sermon, he also confirmed the extraordinary character of the event. The, I quote, the example of a conversion of a N spot was an event that at this place was obviously something new and hadn't happened or been seen before as long as anyone can ever remember. Quote end.
If you put all this together, you realize that this baptism was not a normal ritual, but a demonstration of Protestant power. When performing my postcolonial guided tours in Osnabrück, I visit exactly the place in the choir of St. Mary Church, where this baptism took place four centuries before. After the prayer and before the baptism itself, the boy had been examined in order to find out if he had learned the catechism and could therefore be admitted to the congregation. After the successful examination, there was sung a song and then the, the parents were asked to give the boy a Christian name, of course. They asked the superintendent to name him Christian Christian Gerhard from now on. On a table in the choir, there was dec decorated uh, on a carpet spices and flowers, so it was very nice, everything, and you found this sort of bowl for baptisms filled with water. With this bowl, Ludoviki executed the baptism after the ritual given in accordance to the church constitution. The boy stood in front of the table and was baptized, I quote, in the name of God Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, quote end. After having sung another hymn and after a collection in front of the altar, the act finished by the pastor blessing the congregation. So we have to speak about Christianism and colonialism. So we reach the global sphere, adding a, a coming to the role the Christian mission played in the frame of the European expansion after 1492, which was the birth hour of racism too. The forced conversion to Christianity by the European colonial powers in the modern times, example given by the Spanish in South America, was started by the old Catholic Church, but taken over by the Protestants too. Religion as a main element of social order continued to be a historically influential element after the religious wars of that period. One of the rules in contact with the world outside Europe was heathens, so all non-Christians, heathens were not to be seen as equal humans. Thus, in the mind of the Osnabrück actors, I quote from the sermon now, the bath of rebirth, the holy baptism, was regarded as a proper means on the way to salvation of the lad from an spot country. In the Osnabrück act, we may see very different perspectives. In the eyes of the Protestant players, the baptism as an example of the conversion of an end spot was a laudable labor of Christian love, of course, expressed to this poor foreign lad. They, quote, had converted the sinner from this wrong way and therefore saved his soul from death. But what about the deported young African, which real known we don't know? which real name we don't know. Here we find a quite different dimension. The baptism was an act of exercise domination. His new Christian name, Christian Gerhard, is a new coding that overrides the original identity. The chosen names themselves make visible that the character of the new code defining two dominations, a spiritual one, Christian, Christian, Jesus, and the secular one, Gerhard, Gerhard, the name of the mayor. This does even not change by taking into account that Christian Gerhard, after the baptism, was given free by his masters without any payment. This behavior was not a sign of flourishing tolerance, or even more so of a considered fight against bondage and slavery. The young man still remains an object of the event. He is not a subject able to act in a free way. The color hierarchy still doesn't end. Here we have to deepen the intellectual background at this era. The Osnabrück baptism of Christian Gerhard Schäpler was celebrated in the contemporary literature explicitly as a success of mission in Africa. The Osnabrück Act is mentioned as one of three examples of, I quote, Blacks from Guinea who have been baptized in the Protestant church in different places during the previous century. Quote end. In the author's eyes, it was very urgent to save the souls of the people of Guinea who apparently believed in the devil. I quote, 
the inhabitants of Guinea don't want to be called N spots, but Negrites after the Black River Negro that is crossing their country. However, it's right to call them N spots. On the one hand, the color of their skin is black. On the other hand, they believe in the false god, Fetismo, who obviously is nobody else but the devil himself. He is said to frequently appear to those heavens as a black dog or even a little black man. Quote end. Besides the malicious field research itself, this description is quite interesting. It shows that the point of view of the inhabitants of Guinea concerning the fact that they were named Nigrids after the river and not end spots was not accepted by the Europeans but totally denied a form of overwriting and occupying others' identities. This again shows clearly that the Europeans, because of their religious belief, had a dis disparaging view on these people when meeting them during the so-called voyages of discovery. Their European view would leave their marks on the relation between Christian Europe on the one hand and the heathen rest of the world on the other hand. This European perspective, shaped by religious ideas and classifying humans into good and evil, top and down, was even increased by the growing racism of the colonial and imperial era in, 19, in the 19th and 20th century. In Osnabrück, this became visible, for example, in events near to ethnological exhibitions like the colonial exhibition of 1913 in the former town hall or by the presentation of the two pygmy women, Chicanayo and Asamini, on May 18, 1893, during a lecture of the German Colonial Society in Osnabrück. This part of history is another stay of my post-colonial tour, by the way. After the payment of one Marx, and it was cheaper for pupils, of course, interested people could stare at the two women. They had been brought by the African explorer Franz Stuhlmann from the colony of German East Africa to Germany. And the traveler Bondorf presented them in Osnabrück. Whereas Bondorf talked about his journey to the Upper Neal countries and to the Pygmy tribes of Africa, both female wards, as they were called in the newspaper, sat on a high rostrum. So it was really a, a, a presentation. I quote, from the from the newspapers at that time in their short red little dresses they looked like children although the one was about 22 years old and the other one counted 30 years being married already their body mass is 123 or 124 meters the audience was quite surprised that to the contrary of quote again the dwarfs of the fairy tales and fantasy they were not stunted at all Great surprise. Bondorf's overall rating was, so the final thinking about these human beings, I quote again, it's for sure that these dwarfs are N-spot-like peoples that live on a very low cultural level. They are physically and intellectually disabled on a childish level. So disabled and childish. When analyzing the situation, we see that for the audience, this act enhanced the stereotype of colonial children needing help. In the view of the presented human beings, this kind of colonial scenography was not only very inhuman, as the flaunted people could suffer from European diseases they didn't knew. They also got homesick or even died. They were just objects of a spatial visual instrument of power in which the hierarchy of the colonial, colonized world resonated directly. The colonizers, that means the developed European countries, they stood on top on the ranking of human beings. The others found themselves below. Very often the colonizers ranked the colonized near animals. On the one side, we see the mothers and fathers, the teachers and judges. On the other side, we find the children who had to learn and to obey, and finally, the last um, had to be thankful about it. 
What do we learn from this in a global historic perspective? Whether Berlin or Osnabrück, the colonized view is always an expression of colonialism as a patriarchal mechanism of power. This structure turns colonized people into objects, into non-humans. A certain glance has indeed the power to prevent that the appearance of the third can enter the human sphere. So it's just a visual means to keep people out. Although the phase of German colonial history beginning in 1884 officially ended after the First World War with the Treaty of Versailles, it unconsciously continues to have an effect on society, determining our ideas of foreigners, as a lot of examples prove. This, not at least, has been reinforced by the vehemence with which a colonial power Germany performed in the occupied colonies and because we talk about a European, a transnational phenomenon. I finally want to refer to some events in Osnabrück that handle this history in a quite simple-minded way up to our days, quite close to the principle of the Hagenbeck Ethnological Exhibitions in September 1970, during the weeks of friendship, with the emphasis on Scandinavia and Osnabrück, an indigenous um, family, a Zama family from the north of Sweden, and their reindeers lived on an extension ground of the zoo. Moreover, in 2008, the zoo of Osnabrück organized the so-called Zamburu Nights, so or Jungle Nights, advertising this event by the slogan, Africa is in Osnabrück. During several days in August, African artists, musicians, and dancers appeared, quote, in the exciting Samburu nights. Next door were the enclosures of the African animals, like elephants in the, quote, ballet of the gray giants, or the, quote, Reno lady liar. Regarding this obvious lack of sensitivity towards the own history, we learn in what deep way the racist and voyeuristic influence of colonialism has printed our social subconsciousness up to today. One of these reasons is that in the actual German memorial culture, the critics of racism is only slowly achieving public attention, although the historical evidence is quite clear. The anti-racist and decolonial voices are getting louder though. In addition, there even arise more and more attempts of critical review, so I think we are on a good way. To conclude, today, in the days of globalization, historians have to analyze the roots of the so-called globalized world and what, and what these roots mean for a cooperation or a living together of today and tomorrow. Global history as a concept takes the actual needs of migration societies into account by raising questions and making interpretation offers that are locally anchored, which means they start at a local point, but they point into a global sphere. Its aim is to visualize deeply rooted historical phenomena of exclusion that unconsciously still have an impact on our everyday life today not least of all because questions of inclusion and exclusion are absolutely important for the functioning of societies. In case global history could help to improve that we listen to each other in an open and honest way across countries and cultures, this would show a way to perceive in a respectful kind the different perspectives of a joint history that is part of us all, a history that it has different effects on the one or the other side, on colonized yeah, people or colonized, colonizers. This would be a valuable step in direction of a joint historical consciousness that allows us to live together in a good and respectful way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thorsten, for this presentation. <clears throat> We're um, can be crazy uh, time-wise. I'll be 
ฉันไม่นึกอย่าเลือกใช่อย่า I think after hearing all this and um, obviously also there was a lot of painful matter in it. Um, I think we uh, should take at least the 10 minutes to um, to take a Q and A. Um, so any of you spontaneously want to respond to the presentation? Not immediately. We still have time, so. I found it quite interesting to see, um, actually, in in your presentation, uh, Klaus, um, something that we probably forget nowadays about uh, the trade history is that um, the Central European um, countries were largely also working with a very cheap labor so that actually um, these uh, export goods um, were available in, in such a huge amount. Um, and on the other hand, also, I found it interesting to see um, that there's uh, some uh, absolute uh, continuities, uh, meaning in the inheriting of wealth um, so that you were mentioning for all these um, linen producing um, families and like the ongoing the merchants of, of linen in, in the German towns. Mm. Actually, uh, just yesterday, uh, something came to my mind also that I um, thought I might uh, quote if there are no immediate remarks here because um, coming to um, the Silesian uh, weavers, uh, there have been a lot of uh, cultural um, attempts also to address this problematic conditions or life conditions that they had um, at the time. Um, so there's a there's a poem by Heinrich Heine from uh, 1844 uh, that was first published in Karl Marx's um, journal for that forward. Uh, it's called The Silesian Weavers. And I will, I will just quickly read it. It's one minute. Their gloom enveloped eyes are tearless. They sit at the spinning wheel, snarling cheerless. Germany, we weave your funeral shroud. A threefold curse be within it endowed. We're weaving, we're weaving. A curse on God to whom we knelt when hunger and winter's cold we felt, to whom we flocked in vain and cried, who mocked us and boxed us and cast us aside. We're weaving, we're weaving. A curse on the king, the wealthy man's chief, who was not moved even by our grief, who wrenched the last coin from our hand of meat and shot us screaming like dogs in the street. We're weaving, we're weaving. A curse on this lying father nation, where thrive only shame and degradation, where every flower's plucked ear its bloom, and worms thrive in the dark, rot and gloom. We're weaving, we're weaving. O oh, shuttlefly, loom crank away, we weave unfailing night and day, O oh, Germany, we weave your funeral shroud, a threefold curse be within it in doubt. We're weaving, we're weaving. Mm. Later on, Gerhard Hoffmann also uh, wrote a uh, social drama uh, about this phenomenon of the uh, upheavals of the, the weavers. And so we can see, I mean, a, a continuity, obviously, also of our exploitation, which is not only related uh, to racial questions, but also uh, a lot of course of the last questions. Um, maybe Klaus, you or Thorsten have questions to each other or to the audience?
Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you, both of you, for the really dense <clears throat> lectures, also to bring Ivan's work into context and in the history context again. So, after following you, Thorsten, again, because I mean, we obviously meet in Osnabrück as well, but now having the time here uh, intercontinental to talk about the topic again, I was just wondering, I never asked myself before, if because you are much longer in Osnabrück than we are. So we are just having, spending four years there. Was there all, or ever a discussion of working on a memorial of this history of exploitation in, uh, of the linen production as a fundament, uh, as a fundament of the richness of the city to make this somehow visible? Uh, at all. I mean, we couldn't keep Ibrahim's work. This was never the idea, but uh, I mean, it would be huge enough for all the numbers of, um, how to say, the involvement of Osnabrück in, in the slave trade. But were there ever discussions? Do you know something? No, no, not at all. So, um, I live a bit longer in Osnabrück. I'm not born in Osnabrück, but uh, as we say, we are total open folk. So uh, I work on colonial history on the story of Osnabrück since 1995. And I did some exhibition on it and I always find people who are very interested in it. Uh, but so the idea of making something out of it to, to make it visible as as a memorial or to just uh, have a sort of memorial culture that hasn't not just found the the the, the citizenship of Osnabrück up to now. And I, I do my tours since about 2011, with, which is quite um, perhaps an idea to measure how far this story is uh, uh, published or known. And only in the last two or three years, it's really that people are getting more and more interest because, of course, the, the discussion in in Germany is much bigger today because also the the society itself is changing. It's getting more colored, and so the questions they change. But I remember politicians when they when they think about uh, interesting history. There was one who always told me, when you talk about uh, economic history of your, um, of Osnabrück, always tell about that Osnabrück has been a town of the Hanse, of the Hanseatic uh, group. So this is what is in mind, the economic success during that period of time and not inter, inter national, um, um, yeah, connections. But we can work on it, and yeah, I hope that uh, that the transfers will also be one one really mark in the history of Osnabrück to say here we could do something about it. We're taking this with us back to Osnabrück. I also have a question to both of you. Um, in how far are you actually in exchange with colleagues in African countries in academy and academia here? Do you have like well, working groups or um, student exchange programs or um, is it something you're trying to get uh, funding for? Um, perhaps I start again, I make it very short, Klaus. I, um, with our museum um, collection, we of course have also an ethnographic collection, as I have tried to show to you. Uh, we are preparing uh, research on it, and it will it'll take some days, but of course we will try to have an exchange like that. Uh, we took part in an, uh, our role was very small, but we took part in a project that was looking which objects objects came from Cameroon to German museums. And so, of course, this connection is uh, also a very good start to have connections to Africa, but it's at the very beginning, as in most times in museums, I would say. 
I think I understand that was a question directed to the two of us, so yeah. Um, the university where, where I'm working, we have a um, regional focus point on Central Eastern and Eastern Europe. Yeah? So many of our colleagues, me to some extent, it's rather this dimension where we have our cooperations. Um, and I myself, on these topics, I'm also collaborating with colleagues in Western Europe and in um, North America, but uh, contacts uh, to Africa are really rare. We had a um, conference late September on the colonial dimensions in the history of the city of Berlin, also um, dating back into the early modern period. And there we had been cooperating with colleagues from Cameroon and from Ghana. That was the first time that we really had a fair amount of participants from, from Africa. Yeah, but otherwise, it's, um, um, it's not that easy because there are not these organizational infrastructures which are well established within Europe and um, also with the United States, if I'm talking about um, Germany. Yeah. It costs a lot of effort. Our international um, uh, um, office at the university that organizes student exchange is very, very active. They have partner universities in African countries, but it is rare that we have African students in our seminars. Which was very different in GDR times, I suppose. I mean, I don't know for Frankfurt order, but uh, definitely uh, Berlin and um, many other cities like Halle and um, Leipzig uh, had a lot of uh, students from different African countries. And uh, I think there's uh, maybe also an interesting uh, historical research to be done on, on that subject. Um, I have been recently also uh, asked by several artists uh, of um, different countries, uh, African countries' origins, uh, that they want to um, investigate actually on this history in the universities also. And I think that would be an interesting project also too. To look at. Mm -hmm. Just a very, very tiny remark. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Wall. And then I, I, one, one, one thing that I found very interesting that how this kind of textile production, in a way, is like for these kind of um, merging families, in a way, is a starting point of their investment in a global trade and. Just because also from and there are the examples where it is kind of Australian families linked to to basically then Hamburg families and Hamburg merchant families. And then in the nineteenth century I just came into my mind that the Vermont family, which is probably the most influential family uh, then in the late nineteenth century, they also have their roots in Westphalia. So they also came from Westphalia and then over generations um, basically also takes the same route, becoming like super powerful figures in the Hamburg um, merchant um, bourgeoisie in a way. There's a question or the, yeah, a question from Ulf, who is in the Zoom. Um, I'm wondering, at Thorsten, I'm wondering if, ah, okay. Thorsten just responded. Okay. No, of course, that could be quite interesting to put um, a panel or something about this history. Just a second. I, I'm to... just going to read out the question because the audience cannot read it. It's too small. Okay. So, Thorsten, okay. uh, addressed at Thorsten is the question. I'm wondering if or how the zoo should start being used as a vehicle to sensitize at all. Or instead, just as a bitter negative example, considering how people were discriminated as animals in exhibitions. 
has that the first ever been done consciously anywhere since? And the answer, so it was no, <laughs> please answer. Yeah, so there have been no efforts yet, but it could be quite interesting to, to tell the story when you perhaps visit the, the zoo that um, there have been this, uh, in colonial times, this connection between presenting human beings like animals in a zoo or with these uh, colonial exhibitions, which took place in Osnabrück, um, could be an interesting uh, exhi um, exhibition or um, a try to explain, to explain something. Uh, all in all, I would say it's uh, just not very, uh, I don't think that there will be good efforts because um, there are economical interests and to have wonderful Zamburu nights in this wonderful uh, zoo, which has to pay himself. So you have to earn money and then you have to uh, do events. And there are, of course, groups that just have no problem to, to sing and dance there. But we as we should be aware of what what pictures we touch when we have these um, presentations over there. So it's a question of historical consciousness. Yeah, I mean, um, in the last couple of years, um, in the city of Berlin, there have been uh, a lot of initiatives and exhibitions um, under the title of Decoloniale um, in the uh, regional museums, actually, or meaning like the district museums, sometimes tiny museums, um, but all of them on the same um, idea of looking either into their collections or into the uh, districts uh, and speaking for histories. And uh, I was myself actually also co-curating in, in an exhibition at the Schöneberg Museum, which was retracing um, the, the family history of a family originally came from Cameroon, then over Hamburg dancing uh, to Berlin. And um, so two of the family members, uh, um, siblings were actually advising us on this exhibition. We were very closely developing it together. And uh, I think this this type of initiatives uh, does a lot of good um, in the society because these are also these tiny um, district museums or regional museums are the ones uh, that are reaching a large audience uh, in contrast to a lot of the contemporary art institutions um, that might be more uh, looked at as being more elitist. Yeah, yeah I think um, we have to end here. Our program will go on now with an exhibition opening. Uh, in Actually, it, it started. <laughs> Okay, so we have a, a short break of 20 minutes or so. And um, yeah, thank you so much for both of you. Uh, and sorry again for the technical complications. We were a little bit expecting that it might happen, but uh, in the end, it went through uh, still in a kind of smooth way. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Go you ahead. too, and it was a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, many thanks for inviting us. Hope to see you again. Have a good Bye. day. Bye. Recording. Thank you all for your endurance. Let's give a round of applause for ourselves. <laughs> You know, through the uh, contingent technological failures and, you know, resurrections, we were able to make it. So let's go out. We can take an hour, really. That's, uh, so let's go out there and relax. We come back to the openings of uh, Zoropoku's West. We'll meet here at, um, yeah, 4.30, 4.40. And then we continue. Yeah, thank you. Let's go. <laughs>